So I do no audio here. Or should I no, no audio there. Yeah. Okay, so we're very happy to have Chris Akers today. Uh, he'll be telling us about some work uh, he's been doing with uh, Ned Engelhardt, Dan Harlow, uh, Pennington, and Varden on black hole interior from non isometric codes and complexity. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. Would you like to close the curtain a little earlier? Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Sure. No, 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 no. Yeah. Did I just pull this manual here? No, no, don't touch it. <laughs> no, it's all, yeah, it's Everything all is sophisticated. No, other way. That is not it. I think the description well, is on. It, uh, it takes a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the invite. I'm excited to talk to you all about this. So let me start by remarking that in quantum gravity, it's for a long time by many people been expected that space-time is emergent, valid in some regime. And ADS-CFT is our most well understood example of this. And there, this expectation is realized mathematically via quantum error correction. And so the picture we assign is something like this where you imagine, so this is kind of like a time slice of um, the ADS, that's the disk here, and all of these black dots are like bulk degrees of freedom. You might think of them as qubits. Um, and on the right, we have time slice, you might think of as a, the, the CFT time slice. So now the black dots, the degrees of freedom, they live on the boundary. And there's some map V that maps from these bulk degrees of freedom to the boundary degrees of freedom. And the idea is that the, quote, code subspace of states that don't contain black holes are mapped into the CFT degrees of freedom by some holographic map V, which is an isometry or at least close to one. So this was what we were just saying on the blackboard earlier. And let me remind you what isometry means, because I'm going to be using it quite often in this talk. It's even in the title. So an isometry is nothing more than a linear map from one Hilbert space to another, such that V dagger V equals the identity on A. And you can argue, just from a linear algebra argument, that an isometry can only exist if the dimension of this Hilbert space is at least as big as the dimension of the, the input Hilbert space. So now, it has been understood that since the beginning that you can extend this idea to states with black holes in sort of a, a cheating way. So uh, for those of us who aren't working on this, the code subspace of states not containing black holes, can yes. you decode that a little bit? So yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, so in this paper, what, what, they wanted to, what they asked of you was to imagine that you have, say, the vacuum state of the ADS so or the us, You can't read dark blue on black, can you say? <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yes. Oh, yes. This is um, Paul Mary Dillon Harlow from 2015. Thanks. And uh, yeah, this is my citation. Sorry, you won't be able to read any of them. <laughs> Um, on purpose. <laughs> and uh, what they asked you was that you imagine they, you have the vacuum state and then you consider um, some, some, energy, some energy band above that. There will be some, say, low energy subspace that we're going to call the code subspace. And the reason why we call it a code subspace is, is because they want to think about it like um, what's called the code subspace in quantum computing. So the idea is that... Uh, but states not containing black holes, 
Don't most states contain black holes? Most states contain black holes. So this is some very tiny subspace. This is some very tiny subspace, exactly. So this is some very tiny subspace. Um, this is how this is was the original vision of how error correction related to ADS CFT. And they wanted to say, um, as, I, as I'm going to tell you momentarily, uh, if you want to start talking about black holes, the way that they proposed to do it was you just sort of forget about the, the interior. You sort of forget about the space time that's inside the black hole. You focus on the degrees of freedom outside, and those they could understand as encoded in the boundary in some fairly rigorous sense. An approximate isometry, what's it approximate in? Uh, the operator norm. So, so we'll say, let, let's say, just for definiteness, that V dagger V um, minus the identity is, uh, in, in the operator norm, is uh, very small. Small means small. like a tenth? Small in what? Oh, small, uh, good. Like non perturbatively small in G Newton. So, like e to the minus one over G. So, I can write that here. Should, should the inequality between B and A be greater than or equal to? Yes. Greater than or equal yes. to. It should be greater than or equal to. Yes. And uh, small, yeah. So we want V dagger V minus the identity operator norm to be uh, less than some epsilon, where epsilon is of order uh, e to the minus 1 over G, or, or e to the minus 1 over G times some order 1 over yeah. Thank you. These are good questions. I uh, definitely want to answer questions. They all have like these. So the, the picture with black holes that they proposed was something like this, where now you imagine in your, your bulk you have some big black hole that is this big black dot here, and we're just now ignoring all the, the qubits or degrees of freedom that you might imagine living inside the black hole, and we're encoding the ones outside. As we, as we will review shortly, however, it is known that the black hole interior cannot be reconstructed in the same uh, way. That we stated here, where V is, um, we'll have to generalize the construction. In particular, I will present a proposal in this talk for how it can be reconstructed, the space time behind the black hole, and this will involve a generalization of the conventional error correction formula. And I will also explain the insights that this offers when you try and apply this to the black hole information. So the idea is that we would like some holographic map that we're going to say maps from uh, some Hilbert space h little l tensor h little r um, to some Hilbert space we'll call h capital B. And morally, this is like mapping the interior left and right moving modes to some microstate degrees of freedom that we'll call capital B. And we're going to introduce a system R into which the black hole evaporates. We don't have to, but we, we can, and so we'll, we'll just do that. Um, partly to make connection to these uh, page curve papers from 2019, which I'll remind you of. The full encoding map in this case will be V tensor the identity of R, because R is some auxiliary system that's not necessarily gravitational or anything. So the encoding map, uh, the holographic map doesn't, doesn't do anything to R, it's anything. Why did you choose left and right moving modes? Yeah, that, that decomposition won't be so important. It was morally to, it was morally because we eventually want to make it easy to say that uh, little. There's some confusion about what left and right moving mean. Can, okay. you, can you just explain the little l and little r? Yeah, so for the, for the purpose of this talk, what I mean is that um, maybe best described by this picture. So this picture is a piece of the Penrose diagram uh, where the gravitational space time is to the left and below this. So it's, it's inside this red square here. Uh, this dotted line is the horizon. And this thin black line here is a time slice. Uh, the stuff under this triangle is this auxiliary, auxiliary reference system that, that can be non-gravitational. Uh, they're, they're both touching, they're divided by this solid black line that just indicates that they're, they're coupled if you want. And uh, by this left and right moving modes thing, 
But I, what I really mean is just that there's going to be some degrees of freedom inside the black hole, though some of which we'll call little l, some of which we'll call little r. You might think of them morally like the left and right moving modes in a black hole, where the, the right moving modes means you know, on this Penrose diagram, they would travel, say, up and to the right. And those are the guys that we're going to imagine are entangled with the exterior Hawking quanta that live in capital R in this picture. And the degrees of freedom we're calling little l are the ones that are like left moving modes uh, in this diagram that you know, move up and to the left. Uh, those will be like the degrees of freedom that are associated to the stuff you threw into the black hole. So, so if we're in more than one plus one dimensions, what do you mean by left and right movement? Radially in and outgoing. Yeah. So yeah. the little yeah, r modes are, are radially modes outgoing. don't move radially. Yeah, it, it won't be actually important that I call them left and right moving modes. That's not, yeah. I, I agree, like, you know, and if they're interacting, what's the exact distinction between them? I agree. So I, I'm just calling them L and R just to, uh, I could just call them all one thing, just interior modes. I'm calling them uh, left and right for now, just to uh, have a distinction between two different kinds. One that's going to be like the interior Hawking partners. Just for simplicity, uh, we can drop that distinction if we want. But it's it's still true that like if you had a higher dimensional black hole uh, for which the wave equation separates, each uh, angular momentum mode has a radially ingoing and a radially outgoing uh, solution. And those would be your little L's and little R's. Right, yes, thank you. So in this picture, uh, I've described this left side, and this we'll call the effective description. It's effective in the sense that you might think of semi-classical gravity as an effective description of the true uh, quant theory of quantum gravity. And on the right here, we'll call this the fundamental description. And this R here, this line, is the same R that appears on this left side. So it's, it's perhaps this line right here. Uh, but now what's changed is that we've, re we've replaced this gravitational space-time with this, this dot we're calling B. And we have, this is the map from the effective description to the fundamental description. So the problem, so I mentioned there was a problem, there's a reason you couldn't just have, you couldn't just incorporate black holes into the usual error correction story. That problem is this. As the black hole evaporates, eventually, in this effective description, the, the size of the interior becomes much bigger than the, the size of B. This is because the horizon area of the black hole is shrinking. And meanwhile, the, the interior uh, wormhole or bridge to nowhere uh, is growing. The number of modes apparently entangled with exterior modes is growing. And this is not compatible with V being an isometry. And there's one sharp problem that this raises, which is that there must be a large number of null states annihilated by V, some, some large kernel to V. And there's a lot of uh, dark blue text on black background here, uh, indicating all of the people that, that have said things like this before. So this is very much not the new idea. Did someone have a question? Sorry. Okay. So now this sounds like a problem, this fact that there's a lot of null states. Uh, and we will have to address it carefully. But it comes with a benefit. That benefit is this. When V is non-isometric, it is not necessarily true that this equality holds. What is this equality saying? So on the left here, we have this rho little l, little r, capital R. And this is the, the density matrix of the effective description. So this is, the, this is just the state of all the degrees of freedom in the effective description. And this row capital R is that same density matrix, but you've traced out little l, little r. So on the right here, we just have the state of capital R in the effective description, which you might morally think of as, you know, if, 
the effective description is like the semi-classical description that Hawking might have used. So the exterior radiation would be in, say, some thermal state. That's what, so rho r here would be a, a thermal state. Now, on the left side, what we've done is we've taken the state of the effective description and we've acted V on it. So we've conjugated the density matrix by uh, the holographic map. And uh, so this, be, this whole thing becomes a state on capital B R. And then we've traced out capital B. So we're again left with a state on just capital R. So both sides of this equality are density matrices on capital R. And the statement is, if V is not an isometry, then the state you get on the left is not the same as the one on the right. If it were an isometry, then they would be the same because the, say, by the cyclicity of the trace, you could bring this around and then V dagger V would give you the identity. So you'd just be basically tracing out everything but R and uh, you, you would get this equality definitely holds. But when V dagger V is not the identity, this doesn't hold. Um, so this is good. We don't want this equality to hold because what that tells us is that information about the interior can be quantum teleported out into the radiation. And as we'll see, this is the mechanism that's responsible for the, the quantum extremal surface calculations of the page curve. So I'll explain these things in more detail as we go, but that's the, that's the, the summary of an important point. So, um... It seems like, so, so, there, so far you're discussing two things. One is some kind of effective description in the bulk. Mm -hmm. The other is some exact description in some dual conformal field theory, or something like that. Sure, yes. Um, but then there's a third thing, you know, which is um, that one might suppose that there is also an exact bulk theory like string theory yes, in the bulk. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so what is the relationship of this embedding V? Uh, to, I mean, presumably there's an exact equivalence that anything you can do in, in, on the CFT, you can do in this exact bulk description. Absolutely, yes. Okay, and so, so now you're, so you could also think of your V as being uh, an embedding, since there's a one-to-one -one map, between yes. the exact bulk description and the exact boundary description. Yes. Presumably there's an, also a V that embeds the approximate effective bulk description into the exact bulk description. I agree completely, yes. And so, like, yeah, so we might call that V prime or something, and I, I completely agree with you that that is something I expect to exist. And you can even say all the words I have already said, but with that in mind instead, where now maybe B you regard as, like, the fuzzball state or something. So we'll get a story that's maybe a lot like fuzzball complementary. Okay, good. So these null states, uh, so how do we avoid problems with them, right? Cause, because what we've, sh what we've stated is something like, you have some bulk states that are annihilated by the holographic map. And that's bad because, you know, we imagine that that would mean that they're not physical or something. So, so, so what happens if we're just living our lives in the bulk, we do some operation and map ourselves to a null state? That would be bad. Well, we propose that the holographic map V is such that this can't happen. No effective description observer can detect the presence of these null states. And how does that happen? Well, we propose that effective description observers are computationally bounded. So, let me summarize the basic proposal, everything I've said. Uh, if you have one thing from this talk, let it be this italicized paragraph. So the statement is, there's a large set of null states in the Hilbert space of effective field theory inside a black hole, each of which is annihilated by the holographic map to the fundamental degrees of freedom. However, this cannot be detected by any observer who does not perform an operation of exponential complexity. Now, exponential in what? Uh, okay, and, it would be the black hole entropy. So as a follow-up to my previous question, I guess uh, 
if I were some person who liked exact bulk descriptions, I would just erase the word holographic. Yes, you could. Uh, yeah, you would, whatever put whatever word there you want that then corresponds to like effective. Well, just bulk annihilated design. by the math between the effective description and the exact bulk description. Yeah, I like that as well. So concretely, what we're going to do in this talk is illustrate this idea in several models, which will show have here three nice features. So I'll explain them in more detail, but just following up on Emil's question, yeah. to make sure I understand, in n equals 4 uh, dual to ADS 5 times S5, mm -hmm. what would be the bulk effective description? Are you keeping track of just the supergravity part, or are you keeping yeah, track of the KK modes? Uh, good question, yeah. Um, I'm going to be kind of agnostic about exactly what the, I, I believe I want to say the, just the supergravity part, but you might be able to incorporate some KK modes uh, as long as you're not trying to keep track of um, so much that you effectively have the, the full UV description. I'm trying to tease out this exponential it, yeah. thing to, to try and understand, I mean, if you scatter supergravity modes, you would first, and you can, at high enough energy, you can see those KK modes. Mm -hmm. um, does that count as an exponentially complex operation? Good. So we're going to have the usual limits to uh, effective field theory. So like, if you go to two high energies, you'll also break down the effective description. Uh, in addition to that, we'll have this, this uh, exponential complexity constraint on the regime of validity. What's the parameter in which it's exponential? Ah, the black hole entropy. Thank you. And, and ah. we'll talk more about that. Yeah. Was that your? I, I was going to ask, even in the, in the bulk, so perturbative string theory, that counts as a, you, you would not call that an exact bulk description, right? Yeah, I would not would call that. Deep brain effects of this order e to the minus 1 over g. So are you saying in pure, pure perturbative string theory, I guess around some fixed background, all this isometry should still hold that? It, it's not just a low energy effective supergravity. Yeah, state. so we have to be careful there. So there is some version of perturbative string theory that um, probably fits into this story almost uh, as the effective description very nicely. Once you start adding more and more to it, maybe it doesn't behave like the effective description we want here. This is, yeah, we should discuss this yeah. at some point. Um, here I really have in mind something that's like some low energy theory of gravity, some like semi-classical description or super gravity description. And uh, we're just like we always thought, we're gonna, we're gonna keep the low energy restriction on this theory. We're gonna say that we don't expect the theory to hold when you go to arbitrarily high energies. And then now we're proposing that we also don't expect it to hold when we go to arbitrarily high complexities. <coughs> we're just adding that part. Is it meant to be unitary, the bulk theory? The bulk effective theory? Yes, we, okay, yeah, we're good. It should be unitary, um, but we'll see that, yeah, we'll have, to make this story work, we'll have exponentially small, um, problems with unitarity, but the, our philosophy about those will be that this is just the error inherent in using this effective description. The really, the, the, the true fundamental description will be fully unitary. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just, just as a clarification, so you're saying that there are states within the effective theory that are exponentially complex to observe, not that these are outside of the cutoff. But we want those to be like outside of the cutoff. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. So the states in the effective theory will be sub-exponential complexity states and low energy states. So, yeah. so, I see. Yeah. What's the energy scale here again? It's like mass of the black hole. Yeah, the like the usual, well, so, yeah, like the Planck, like, that, that one's like Planck uh, scale. Yeah. So here it complexly relates to the entropy of the black hole. Um, the energy scale is the, the usual one. Is there supposed to be some gauge symmetry associated to these null states? That is a great question. Um, 
some people do, like Don Merrill and others, do want to think about it this way. I'm going to say that that's not necessarily how we want to think about it. Because as I'll argue later, there's going to be one unique sub-exponential state. So if you add one of these null states, it'll make your state no longer of sub-exponential complexity. So all, as I'm going to say, all of these null states will be exponentially complex. And so if you just added it to your, your effective description state, then you would, you would no longer have an effective description state of sub-exponential complexity. It will now be, so, so then we would say that's outside of your. So it's not going to be like we sometimes do where we have null states and we take a quotient to describe exactly. physical Hilbert space in terms of some VRST complex. Exactly. Example. I'm not going to think about it's it like that. Gonna, you have actual null states in your physical Hilbert space. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have null states and then we're going to have to uh, work hard to make sure that they don't cause any problems. And well, that, they're not norm zero. They're just annihilated by this B. So maybe I, I should call them kernel states. Kernel. <laughs> you can call them kernel states. Yeah, my, my philosophy is going to be that the, the true theory is the fundamental theory. And if you want to, if you have two effective description states and you really want to take their inner product, you shouldn't just take their inner product in the effective description. You should instead use a modified inner product that puts a V dagger V in between them. So, and then that V dagger V, yeah. So if I have like effective description state psi one and psi two, the effective description predicts some inner product that's like you know, psi one, psi two, rocket. Um, my philosophy is going to be that actually the, the true theory is the fundamental one. So to take the inner product, you should map them both to to the fundamental description and then take their inner product. Uh, and then um, you would have something that looks like this with the V dagger V in between. So if psi one was a null state, then its norm would be, if it was a kernel state, as you said, then its norm with this modified inner product would be zero. So kernel states are now in the fundamental theory. That's the statement. That's they are roughly how I would like to yeah, say it. Yeah. But you're saying there's no effective theory where you could remove them in terms of macroscopic gravity. Yeah, yeah. That macroscopic gravity sort of uses them in its description, but uh, yeah. So, so this operator v, the, the holographic map or exact map, is is part of like your effective theory data. Ah, good. So I would say you could talk about the effective theory without ever knowing v, but if you really and uh, as I'll argue, you... for, for example, if you want to take inner products, you said you need you need v dagger v, right? Oh, good. Yes. So, so one very very important thing about this model, which is the, what I'm going to get to next, uh, is that if psi one and psi two are of sub exponential complexity, then this is going to be very very close ah. to just psi one psi two. So, you, so if, if they're sub exponential complexity, you would have never noticed a problem. I see. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. So the, the concrete models that we're going to um, show have these three nice properties. So they're going to preserve the inner products between states of sub-exponential complexity, uh, where sub-exponential means in the black hole entropy. And it's going to allow so-called reconstruction of sub-exponential operators. So it's like a quantum error correcting code, which allows you to reconstruct bulk operators in the CFT. But now the bulk operators that you're allowed to reconstruct are those that have sub-exponential complexity. This is kind of a new thing in quantum information theory. So I don't know if, if this is in particular appealing to any of y'all, but historically, whenever you talk about error correcting codes, the operators that you can reconstruct in these codes form some sub-algebra. This is different. This is a new type of code in which the operators you can reconstruct are a set of sub-exponential operators, which don't form a sub-algebra because you can say take simple operators and then multiply them together many times and you get some uh, big operator that's not sub-exponential. That was a digression. So the, the third thing that we'll get in these models is the quantum extremal surface formula. And it'll match 
these calculations of the page curve that happened in 2019. Yeah. But now, having said that, we can apply this proposal to the black hole information problem directly. And let's see how that happens. So to remind us ourselves uh, a formulation of the information paradox, you could say Hawking argued that we cannot simultaneously have these three things. One is a finite black hole entropy with a, with a state counting interpretation. Two is a unitary black hole S matrix. And three, that effective field theory is valid around and inside black holes wherever there's not large curvature say near the horizon of a large black hole. Now, uh, ADS-CFT, to the extent that you buy it, shows that one and two are compatible, but three has arguably been harder to understand. And these citations here are Mathur and then uh, AMPS, so the firewall paradox and the small corrections theory, which, which show difficulties with trying to reconcile uh, unitarity and effective field theory being valid near black hole horizons of small curvature. And three is very important because it's what distinguishes black holes from say just lumps of coal. Black holes have these interiors. So what we're gonna do is present a dynamical model that realizes analogs of one and two and also realizes an analog of three but now three will be slightly different. It'll say that effective field theory is valid for sub-exponential observables. And these, this one, two, and modified three are not incompatible because we're realizing them in a model. And so in this model, we can say the information problem is resolved. This is not quite the same thing as saying this is how the information problem is resolved in gravity because we're not showing the gravity has all of the features of this model, but we're just showing that this, these, this one, two, and modified three are not a priori incompatible. So, yeah. so, so uh, an operator in the EFT, which is both below the energy scale, but also sub-exponential, is it then very non-local? Is that the point? Um, so I mean, so that, that, that one should be good. That could be local. That's, a, that's a, a, an allowed operator in the effective description. You said some exponential. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, an exponential one. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah, that okay, one is not guaranteed. The, what are the ones that are even in the EFT that are actually exponential? Those are very non-local things, like. So, so an example of one that we believe um, exists and sort of breaks the semi-classical description is if you tried to run the AMPS experiment. So you, and this certainly happens in these models. So. If you like take a black hole and you let it evaporate for a long time, so you have an old black hole, and uh, so you know, it's more than half done evaporating post page time. You take the radiation, and you, there's there exists some exponentially complicated unitary on this radiation. That's low energy. All the modes involved are like Schwarzschild um, length, and what this unitary does we believe is uh, effectively pulls out the purification of some other mode that exists behind the horizon. So, you know, you could, by acting some exponentially complicated unitary on the radiation of an old black hole, excite some degree of freedom, say, behind the horizon. And this is not something that you would say is possible if you took very seriously the effective description of the state, because the unitary here shouldn't do anything over there. Okay, so that, that's how it applies to the information paradox. Happy to talk more about that. I'm gonna now dive into our basic model, which is the static model. So here I'm just defining V for you. And uh, this is it. So remember V is supposed to be a map from little l, little r to capital V. And what this map is, is we just first append some system little f in some state that we'll call psi naught. That's just there for generality. You don't have to worry about it. You, know, you could have it there, you could not have it there. So we append this little f, then we act some unitary on them. This unitary will be drawn 
at random from the Har Ensemble. And then, of course, this outputs the same number of qubits that we put in. And we want to model an old black hole where b is smaller than little l, little r. So we're going to post-select onto all the extra qubits. Post-selecting means mathematically you're acting with this, say, bra zero on these qubits. And this is not, v is not an isometry because there's this post-selection. So you map this post-selection allows you to just force them to be in state zero, these qubits. And so you're mapping from this larger to smaller Hilbert space. Uh, in general, this will mess up the norm of your state quite a lot. So to fix that, we multiply by the square root of the dimension of p, which will, which will rectify that problem. Uh, so some notes. U is drawn only once. So averaging is not intrinsic to this model. However, we will use averaging over U as a tool to learn about its typical features. So you'll see me write things like with integrals over U. I'm doing that to, to do a calculation, but um, we're going to be careful that the statements we want to make are true for, for any particular U that you, that you drew um, with high probability, not just true on average. So the, the most important thing about these models is the statement about inner products I'm going to make now. So first, we're going to observe that this inequality holds. So here, we have psi 1 and psi 2. They're both just states on little l, little r. We're not saying they're sub-exponential states or anything right now. They're just states on those qubits that we call little l, little r. And uh, so in this term, we're taking their inner product. And in this term, we're first acting the holographic map on them and then taking their inner product. And so this is the difference between the inner products and the fundamental description and the effective description. And we're taking their absolute value. So that when we now integrate over u, there's not going to be any cancellations. So, um, and what you can, you can actually compute this using this uh, unitary integration technology, and you get this number. So this number is very small. As I'll say, I'll explain it in physical terms momentarily, but remember B is, this is the dimension of Hilbert space B. So if B had n qubits, this would be like two to the n, this, this dimension. So this is a, a really small number when B is at all macroscopic. So one way of interpreting this inequality is to say that V is very likely to preserve the inner product even though it's not even approximately an isometry when little l, little r are much bigger than b. You say averaging doesn't, is not essential for this. Yeah, so it's, it's important for this calculation. To, like this, this statement, of course, averages. Uh, but then I will explain momentarily that you can use this plus some additional calculations that we're going to do to show that if I just picked a single u at random, that this would still be true for a large number of states with high probability. And, uh, okay, so a note about the physical interpretation of this suppression. So morally, our model regards the logarithm of B as the black hole entropy. So this error, this, this difference that shows up on the right-hand side is order E to the minus S black hole over two. So it's like exponentially small in the black hole. So the, the inner products and the fundamental and effective description are, are supposed to be the same up to something very small. And that's true even though um, L and R are much bigger than B. So, you know, when I first learned about this, I found it very shocking. So psi is a tensor product state? It has uh, a... ah, psi 1 and psi 2? If I take linear combinations, can't I? I can find things in the kernel, right? Yes, you can find things in the kernel. And, so, and then, and then the term on the left would just be zero, and the term on the right would not be. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to get to a specific case like this. So the statement here, 
I'm just trying to I tease out like the rank nullity theorem in such a situation, right? Yeah, you have yeah. a map from a big space to yeah. a small space. Okay. Yeah. You know the dimension of its kernel. Yeah. So, like, there are some terms where the first thing is zero, some terms where it's yes. not. So, this will be a, a very big concern whenever we do this thing where we pick a particular u. So, here we're averaging over u. So, what we're doing is first picking psi 1 and psi 2, the state um, little l, little r. And then we're integrating any state, over including u. linear combinations. Any state, yeah. You just fix those first, okay. and then we're integrating. Over. So for some of the so, use, so no, for any u, there's such a kernel, right? Yes, but yeah. So if, for, if you pick but a finding, u, but finding the psi's that are in the kernel is an operation of exponential complexity. That's well, true. There was an but, inequality claimed here that didn't depend on psi. So there exists yeah. some psi's yeah. for which that there exists some psi's. But if you pick a generic psi. It's but not there's nothing kernel. about this being generic psi. Yeah, in that form. yeah, yeah. So let, let me let me be clear. I, I I completely get where you're coming from. So the point here is that you, so we're picking psi one and psi two first. Okay. And then of course it will be the case for some u th those guys are null states. Yes. But for most u they're very they're very far from being null states. Okay. So that's the point of this inequality. But it's not the same thing as the statement I ultimately want, which is what you're getting at, which is that if I have a particular u, of course there's going to be many many psi one and psi two that are that don't satisfy this, and and we're gonna we're gonna get to that momentarily. So at, at this level, I'm trying to give intuition just for the statement that if you happen to just fix psi one and psi two for most v's, uh, they'll satisfy this. Okay. Yeah. And so to give intuition for that, uh, I want to illustrate it using an even simpler model that we'll call the phase model. So here we're just let's simplify things by forgetting about little l. We'll just have little r, and it'll have some number of some states that we'll index by n, and then this this v phase will be a linear map defined by this equality. So there's going to be a capital capital B as always with an index little b, and this map uh, gives us a superposition over all the states in capital B with uh, coefficients that are just these random phases. So this theta here just depends on little n and little b. And it just, it's random as a function of those guys. And then you can just compute on a piece of paper, if you have it now, this inner product. So you just take any two states in little r. We'll call them n and n prime. Act v phase on them, and then take their inner product. What you get is, so you get this equality, um, where you get one over the dimension of B, and then the sum over all states in capital B of this difference in phases. And so little b in this argument is the same, but little n is, is different. One is n, and one is n prime. So when n equals n prime, this, this sum will just give you a sum of, over, a sum of one over all states in B. And then that, that cancels with this guy to give you one. Okay, so the inner product between n and n is, is one. If n does not equal n prime, then what you get here is basically just a random phase. And we're just summing a random phase over all states in B, which is essentially a random walk that has magnitude of order square root of B. So that square root of B divided by B gives you something that's order one over the square root of b. So if n and n prime are not the same, then uh, we get a very small number. But this is true, uh, sort of, even if little r is much bigger than capital B. So, so the inner product is approximately preserved in this sense, uh, even in this regime. Now, I, I will say, for those of you who are curious, this. There's a caveat here in this random walk argument. So when little r becomes doubly exponentially big in the size of b, then this random walk argument has a subtlety and this no longer holds. But it can be exponentially big in b and this still holds. Doubly exponentially big as to b. So the idea is that you, can, you see we can fit a large number of almost orthogonal states into a Hilbert space many more than the dimension might have naively suggested. OK, so now to get to Clay's point. So far, we've seen that the inner product between 
any two particular states is likely to be preserved up to this small number, but we can say more, and we want to say more. We want to say that for any particular u, it is very likely that the inner product is preserved up to some small number. So here it's also exponentially small in the black hole entropy, but for a gamma that's order one, it's not going to be exactly a half. Um, we want this, the inner products to be preserved simultaneously for all states of sub-exponential complexity. And to get this, we're going to have to use measure concentration, which is a theory with results like the following. It says, for any k Lipschitz function, we have a function f that maps uh, from the unitary group uh, u of n to the real numbers, we have this inequality. So this dark blue here is Meeks, M-E-C-K-E-S. This inequality says that the probability, you're pick picking, um, so our probability on UN is the uniform measure on this group. So the probability on that measure that F of some U is different from the average by more than some epsilon is small. It's less than this exponentially small quantity. So, so what's important is uh, here we have this capital N. So as, as you consider N, N of the unitary group to be very large, this thing becomes uh, very small. So if you say hold epsilon fixed or have it scale uh, in the right way with N, then this right hand side will be exponentially small. What's the definition of a complexity of a state in this model? Yeah, so it's so we're going to have to, if you want to define that, pick a reference state, say the whole zero state, and then uh, pick a gate set, and then ask how many gates does it take to get epsilon close to that state? Okay, so what is it in this model? Uh, we are, uh, yeah, so I would prefer not to specify any particular gate set or reference state, and you can just argue that whatever you do choose, the answer will be um, the same as any other choice up to polylogarithmic factors. So if it's exponential with one gate set, it'll be uh, exponential with another. If it's polynomial with one, it'll be polynomial with another. Maybe generically or something. It's probably something generic. Uh, otherwise, I'll just choose the states in the kernel to be the simple states of a fixed U. I fix a U, I'll choose the states in the kernel. Ah, uh, yeah, we, we, we fix it the other way. So we, we fix a reference state and we fix uh, a gate set, and then we are going to argue that there exists some V. In fact, it's like, if you just picked it random, you would get a V with high probability that has this property. And to understand the intuition for applying in gravity, like what, what do you have in mind as sort of the simple states in effective field theory? Yeah, so perhaps you say start from the vacuum state, and then you um, and start then, from the vacuum state. Yeah, like uh, usually if you have a lattice model, the kind of simple states are like tensor product states, and the vacuum state is quite complicated. That's yeah. Right. So that's very different than what we would do in that. It is very different from that. I think in the lattice model, you could say that they're both like you can get to the vacuum state from one of these tensor product states. It depends on exactly the theory, but. Um, if you want, you know, we should definitely include the vacuum state as part of our sub-exponential states uh, for this to work. And if you wanted to reconcile that with the tensor product states also being sub-exponential, I'm sure that would work in some lattice models for some Hamiltonians. For others, like ones where it's exponentially hard to prepare the ground state from the all-zero state, that wouldn't be true. But then uh, we'd have to make a choice. Not. For this to work, we'll want the vacuum state. Because the vacuum state should be in our effective theory. Yeah, is, don't you want to just say, okay, we take the vacuum state as our reference state, and then our sub exponentially complex things that we allow are anything you can get to from the vacuum state by applying low energy operators in the effective field theory. That's, yeah, that's what I want to say. And yeah, but I would like to take that perspective. Yeah. Thank you. 
So if you apply this measure concentration formalism to our problem, uh, what you get is the following. So you get a statement like this, where um, the probability over your choice of u that the inner product, so, okay, so here, we're considering all psi and phi that are sub-exponential states. So let's say we pick some reference state that's like our vacuum state. Uh, psi and phi are any two sub-exponential states. We're gonna take a supremum over them actually. So we're gonna find the two that have the worst inner product preservation. So the probability that there exists two sub-exponential states with error uh, worse than some exponentially small amount is going to be doubly exponentially small. So here we have e to the minus b to the something else. So e to the minus b, so b is, remember, exponential in the number of qubits that make the black hole. So the statement here is that almost all u will give us a model in which all sub-exponential states have their inner product approximately preserved by b. And um, can I ask, so I forget exactly when we started, how much time? We started late. I mean, we started around like 1.40, so uh, another good 10, 15 minutes if you want. All right, I'm gonna make some executive choices. Uh, so there was two other things I wanted to show you about this model, but I'm gonna go through them just kind of at a high level. So one is a statement about reconstruction, which for our purposes, I'm gonna say, um, you, know, you can talk about this in terms of, I have some operator in the effects description and I wanna write the analogous operator in the fundamental description. Uh, or you could also say, this is, this is basically equivalent, that I have, uh, like what, if I give you some effective description state, you know how to get the fundamental description state you act v. What if I do the opposite problem? I give you the fundamental description state, how do you find the effective description state? Because V is not an isometry, so you, you can't just act V dagger. And so there's an important theorem that we prove that allows this to be possible. So the upshot is that if I give you the fundamental description state, you will be able to find the effective description state of sub-exponential complexity that maps to it. So the key fact that we prove is that for any two sub-exponential states, psi one and psi two, with overwhelming probability, uh, this is very similar to the statement we already showed, this is true. So the distance between psi one and psi two and like Hilbert space norm in the effective description is going to be essentially the, the same as the Hilbert space distance between the images of psi one and psi two in the fundamental description. There's just going to be an exponentially small change. So like two, two close states in the effective description will become two close states in the fundamental description, and two far away states will become two far away states. So even though V is highly non-isometric, it is approximately isometric and invertible on the set of sub-exponential states. So just note this inverse is not a linear operator, it's not a like V dagger, because the set of sub-exponential states does not form a subspace. It's like, you know, you can form a complete basis of states for the effective description that all have sub-exponential complexity. So if you took the subspace that they span, that would be the entire thing. So you shouldn't think about sub-exponential states as a subspace. They're just, they're really some set. Um, so and it's for that reason, the inverse won't be a linear operator. So let me just skip over this part. Um, I'll say that this nonlinearity might be reminiscent, so I'm reading from here basically, of some, a proposal by Papadotomus and Raju, that's this blue, from 2014. But the invertibility that we have here avoids ambiguities that arise there. Happy to talk more about that. Let me uh, skip that for now. So the third thing I wanted to tell you about this model was that we can derive a QES formula, meaning so 
if you want to compute an entropy of some factor in the fundamental description, you can do that by looking at the effect of description state and applying the quantum extremal surface formula. This is, say, um, I would argue, what underlies the validity of these page curve calculations from 2019, or a way of thinking about it. Let me, let me not go through this unless you all. Well, I'm a bit confused about the logic. So, okay. I mean, your V, I mean, it, it doesn't have any dynamics in it. It's just some random unitary operator. Like, uh, you just pick some U, you pick some factors called L and R that it acts on. There, maybe there's some inequality on the dimensions yeah. and there's some projection. That's it. Yeah. And now you say, oh, we always get a quantum extremal surface formula. Doesn't that seem like kind of too much? So I, perhaps what you're getting at is that there's no dynamics here. So how, how do you have like the extremality of the time direction, for example? And then also there's a, so here in the static model, it would more properly be called the quantum minimal surface formula. Momentarily, I'm gonna show you a dynamical model with some like toy version of dynamics, uh, which you might feel more comfortable with relating to the page curve calculations. But are you saying that there's no dynamics in holography? If this is really a toy model of holography? Oh, no, there is there are, there's certainly dynamics in holography. Absolutely. Okay. This, is, this, is, this is a model of the holographic map acting at one time. So we're just fixi we're fixing our attention to one time right now. We're talking about the holographic map. Uh, say, like, just, just say for definiteness, um, if you want, we could just have say like the thermal field double and the effect of the description we're thinking of is living on some time symmetric slice uh, in the bulk. And then the fundamental description is living on like the t equals zero slice of the CFT. So we're, we're the you analogy of the map out. from bulk to boundary states is basically a random unitary operator. <laughs> I mean. In this model, yeah, it's random unitary. So we can prove it's a random unitary. So we can prove some um, statements using metric concentration. So this is like a proof of principle uh, momentarily, we're, it's not going to be exactly a random unitary. We're going to add in some toy dynamics. Maybe you'll feel more comfortable with that. This is supposed to just be a model of some, some physics of the holographic map at one time. Should I be surprised that they seem to be roughly like a random unit? You know, I mean, you might imagine that the holographic map is something very special, like there's a yeah. lot of structure to this. Yes, yeah. that's kind of what that, I'm driving at. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, well, why is it that I can somehow capture this by just drawing something from the higher ensemble? Like, yeah, absolutely. The CFT as a as a dictionary is pretty. Well, yeah, it's it's pretty special. So there's many things I think I could say about this. So I think the surprise you're pointing out is the surprise that um, came even even before this model and say the random tensor network. And the fact that the random tensor network from 2015 proposed by like Patrick Hayden and Xiaoling Shi, that seems to have this quantum minimal surface formula already. And they were just using a random tensors to, to make up their bulk. I think that was very surprising. Like, why is that gonna be a good model of holography, which is very, very specific, has a very specific uh, holographic map. Um, I, I have some personal conjectures about why that is. I think that's a very poorly understood thing. At this level, we're not saying holography, we think, is, a, is like a random unitary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're just saying that this has, it, using these random unitaries, we can define a model that has some nice physics. And we're saying, look, there's, therefore this physics exists. We can say reconcile these three things that previously had seemed paradoxical. Um, maybe this is also how gravity works. <coughs> So maybe if I could rephrase the question. Um, so at the moment, the discussion is very general, applies to any two unitary systems, any, any, two, any two Hilbert spaces, yeah. okay? So yeah. Hil you know, Hilbert space, big Hilbert space could be a gas of, I don't know, two to three, seven million yeah. photons, and uh, the small Hilbert space could be, you know, two to the thousand photons. Yeah. And you would say that there exists such a random projector but I'm not going to impute any properties of black hole physics to gases of right. photons. Absolutely, yeah. So, so at this level, right, we have not introduced any dynamics. And an important part of the holographic duality being non-trivial is that you can, say, uh, evolve on one side and then map, and you get the same state as if you had mapped and then evolved. 
And so at this level, I have not yet shown you anything that looks like that. I'm about to. Okay. Um, but you know, the first step, it just turns out that there's a lot of non-trivial physics that you already need in just the mapping stage to get uh, gravity. So the, the dynamics are an additional thing that you also want, I agree. Yeah. So yeah, let me, let me skip over the QES formula. I said a few words and talk about the dynamical model. So up till now, as I'll pointed out, we've discussed a model of the holographic map for only a single time slice. But we can also include dynamics. Uh, so we're going to have a toy version of dynamics. The idea is that as time evolves, the Hilbert spaces change size, the black hole shrinks, the interior grows. And to model this, we can introduce some Hilbert spaces that depend on time. So an L of t, an R of t, and then a, a, a B of t. And we're going to have some map, we'll say V of t, that also depends on time. And we're going to define a discrete time evolution u of t that is equivariant in, in this sense, where if you took your effective description state and then mapped it to the fundamental description and time evolved, you would get the same thing as if you had first time evolved and then mapped the state. So we'd like to model the full dynamical process of collapsing some matter to form a black hole and then watching it evaporate to see if the process is unitary. So let's start from the fundamental description. So it's going to look just like this. So we're going to model the collapsing shell as these m naught qubits or qubits whose state we control. We'll put whatever you want there. The star could have had one state or another. And then for generality, like we had our little f, we'll also have these extra qubits uh, that, that'll be n naught minus m naught qubits. So in total, we're inputting n naught. Uh, they're going to be in some fixed state, and the collapse will be implemented by some random unitary u naught. So again, we're just going to model it using random unitaries. In our paper, we actually have slightly more realistic models where it's not just like one big random unitary, it's something maybe a little bit closer to what gravity is doing. And the idea is that at each time t, we act with a random unitary which absorbs one infalling qubit and radiates two outgoing qubits. So you can see here, so u1 is the, like the first time evolution step, and it's taking in not just the output of u0, but also this extra red line. And it's outputting some, you know, the, the black lines here, but also two lines that we're coloring blue. So these two qubits we imagine as just going off, they're like the radiation that it's emitted. And so there's two that come out, and one that comes in at every time step, that's just the choice we made so that it'd be kind of like a general black hole that's maybe absorbing something, but we want it to radiate away, so it's going to radiate more quickly than it's absorbing. This was the simplest thing we could think of that does that. And this model manifestly has a finite black hole entropy, it's a finite number of qubits, and a unitary S matrix because the time evolution here is just a bunch of unitaries. Be back to. So what about an interior? To understand that, we need to define a holographic map V. And we do that as follows. So it's defined by this picture. So on the left here, I've just drawn a piece of the fundamental description dynamics that we had before. So here I've just had a couple time steps. And on the right here, uh, I'm just sort of deforming that picture a little bit to demonstrate how we're defining the holographic map. So we've just taken these legs that were output, they were just capital R uh, in the fundamental description, and we've, on this drawing, bent them around and then bent them around again, so they come out like R. So, you, so when we bend around the legs uh, like this up top, that's like post, we're post selecting onto this maximally entangled state. That's what this drawing means mathematically. So we have some like qubits, these lines, and then uh, these angled brackets means we're post selecting those qubits onto this maximally entangled state. And then when we have these angled lines, that means we're inputting the maximally entangled state. 
And so it, it, when you convert this drawing into math, you just, it just manifestly happens that the state here on BR in his left side is the same as the state here. I'm trying to circle this part and this part. Those are the same state. Like, so really bending around the lines <coughs> is, is, as suggested by the drawing, just doing nothing to the state. It's just like moving the lines. Um, but that is realized mathematically by um, just inserting maximally entangled states. What's important about this, this version of drawing the picture is that now we can regard this setup as a holographic map. So everything between, so everything above this line and below this line is what we're calling V for this dynamical model, or V of T. And so, you know, everything below this line, or this part and this part, those are the effective description states. So in this effective description state, we have, say, little r is maximally entangled with capital R. Okay. So I claim, though I won't argue it, um, you can get it from this picture if you want, is that these are equivariant in the sense that we said. So, uh, encoding and then evolving gives you the same thing as evolving and encoding. And you can also argue that in a static model, all those three features that we had carry over. So this guy is an approximate isometry on sub-exponential states. We have an invertible encoding on sub-exponential states and therefore reconstructable sub-exponential operators. And you get something that's like the QES formula for computing entropy. So you, know, you can take the radiation at some time, compute its entropy, and it will look like um, you know, after the page time, it reaches into the black hole. Happy to say more about that. Things I don't have time to mention. Um, these are some of them. So the relation to the final state proposal of Horowitz and Malvasena. So they also had post-selection that was allowing them to have a unitary black hole evaporation. Mathematically very similar, but the physical interpretation is quite different. So their, their post-selection happened at the singularity because of bulk dynamics. Our post-selection happens in the holographic map. Uh, and there's some other important differences, like they didn't have complexity as part of their story, but we do. We can also talk about what happens if you have multiple black holes that are maybe entangled together. Um, we can connect this to, I don't know if y'all are familiar with this, but John Preskill and others ha had a paper um, talking about uh, codes that had, that, in which you could see the interior um, and the, of a black hole that involved pseudo-randomness and what they called ghost operators. Our story connects to theirs, maybe goes a little further. We could talk about what our model predicts about the generic state firewall paradox. It makes interesting predictions, but you could always sort of tweak our models to make a different prediction. So I would say ultimately it's kind of agnostic about how that paradox is resolved. There are many exciting future directions, two of which are, um, so you know, we, we here gave a proposal for how you could reconcile three things that seem paradoxical, but it's not exactly clear that that's, you know, it's not clear at all that that's how gravity happens to resolve the information paradox, right? So, so this is a model in which you have a similar paradox that's resolved in a nice way. Does gravity do it like that? Who knows? So you might try and improve these models by making them more gravity-like until you can understand that question better, say by adding the Rinsen variance instead of just qubits. Uh, also, applying this to, say, cosmology, and not, not just black holes, but, say, the Sitter horizons, that would also be interesting. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. So, but, let's see if I can summarize. So, um, in this last bit, um, what you're relying on is that Underneath it all, in the exact theory, there's unitary dynamics. So the resolution of the information paradox was assumed from the beginning. 
Uh, I wouldn't I would necessarily say, like, so, yes, there is, it's unitary dynamics in the fundamental description. Uh, I don't, you know, just like ADS-CFT predicts there would be unitary dynamics um, from the beginning. To us, the, the part of the information paradox we were trying to um, get at with this model was how that's reconciled with having a smooth interior. So, but again, um, so far everything is consistent with uh, your unitary dynamics being a lump of coal for which there is no such smooth interior. So could have, again, these could have been two, any two uh, Hilbert spaces of, of differing dimensions. Yeah. So you could, you could define a map uh, V that's very much like this. And, uh, you know, the dynamics of a lump of coal, I expect, would be chaotic enough that this V might have similar properties for, uh, for a coal as the ones we described here. However, but, black, but coal doesn't have a smooth interior. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. At least not for something that looks like a uh, vacuum. Exactly. So the, yeah, so I agree. You could say, why does this story not predict a interior for a lump of coal? And there's a few places that it could break down. So you need not just a holographic map, but you also need these equivariant dynamics. So, so the lump of, so you have to, the effective description that you get has to also allow for some uh, local um, Hamiltonian that has dynamics that would be equivariant with that map. And that's not at all clear to me that that exists in, say, a lump of coal. But is it, is it fair to say that, so, so there's some underlying unitary dynamics that explains why uh, information can be preserved. And then sounds like what you're doing on top of that is to say, oh, let me construct this effective field theory, which has the Hawking process going on at the horizon. And let me construct a projection operator at each step that's, you know, compatible with time evolution that projects the non-unitary Hawking process onto the unitary dynamics. Right. And so then properties of the unitary dynamics become properties of the projection operator. Uh, sure. Uh -huh. So all of your QS formulas and so on are, are and you know, islands or what, whatever it is that, that, that one likes about you know, effective field theory yeah. uh, that has been you know, gleaned from the last few years basically become statements that uh, uh, you know, no, the Hawking process isn't something that uh, you know, um, correlates early, early Hawking photons with late Hawking photons. But there's some projection operator that I can act on the system that 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 introduces those correlations. And yeah. uh, okay, so so the correlations weren't there in the effective field theory. The, the correlations were imposed on the effective field theory by projecting it. Yeah. And so 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 the core, all all the properties that the unitary dynamics has that correlates the early radiation with the late radiation are just not there in the effective description. They're, in, they're there once you've projected the, that effective description. So the, they have to be properties of the projector, not of the effective field theory. Right, and yeah, we're arguing that uh, if it's an asymmetric map with very uh, general features, that that will do that, right, yeah. Well, I guess, I would, I guess one would add to that that, that uh, you know, any attempt to do this through an isometric embedding runs afoul of Matur's theorem yes, in some yes. essential way. Yes, so absolutely. this is like the only way that that could, uh, yeah. could work yeah. and I be agree. compatible with effective field theory. I agree with that, yeah. I agree with that. No, yeah, I think that, I completely agree with the point you're bringing up that, you know, the, the hard part is not just saying all these words I said, but also saying why it doesn't imply something wrong about, say, coal. And, uh, I think to have a fully satisfactory answer for that, you, I would want something that, um, I would want to understand the dynamics better. Like why is it the case that there is a natural holographic map and dynamics that are equivariant with that in gravity's case and not in the cold case? I, I don't feel like I have a satisfactory answer to that, but I, to even get started with that question, I, I first want to understand about this one. Yeah. So I think maybe we'll continue some of the questions afterwards. I'll just stop the recording. We'll think our.